You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. So let me ask you this. Who is the Jesus that you have been told about, that was preached to you, that you trusted in? Is the Jesus that you were told about the Jesus of life enhancement, uh, to make your, your life better, to, to solve the problems that you have, uh, to be able to apply five steps to a better marriage and, and six steps to get out of debt? Uh, is that the Jesus that you were introduced to? And if so, is that Jesus, the Jesus worth living for? And if he's a Jesus worth living for, is he a Jesus worth dying for? And what happens when you, you come and trust in the life-enhancing Jesus and your life is not enhanced, at least in the way that you think it should be enhanced, what you think is enhancement? Is that still a Jesus worth living for? And so, is he a Jesus worth dying for? Who's the Jesus you were introduced to? Were you introduced to the Jesus who is not a Jesus of life enhancement, but the Jesus of the Word of God who is holy? The Jesus who is just and righteous? The Jesus who came not to enhance your life and so that you can grow in prosperity and wealth and be free of sickness as you live in this temporary world, but the Jesus who brings everlasting life to all who repent of their sins and believe upon him. The Jesus who is, the Jesus who is worth living for, worth dying for. Who is the Jesus that you were introduced to? Is he a Jesus that is worth suffering for when the world comes against you because you live for this Jesus? Is he the Jesus that is worth giving your life for? The Jesus that know that even when your time on this earth is done, you will be with him for all eternity. And he is worth being with for eternity. Because he is all glorious and righteous and holy. My friends, I hope you were introduced to the latter Jesus. Because that is the Jesus of Scripture. And when we know this Jesus, we know him to be the Jesus who is worth our lives. And that our lives are for him. That we were put here and we live here for him. And our lives are all for his glory. Even if living for his glory means that we suffer in what we do, that the world comes against us. Even if that means we die for living for his glory. He is worth it. And I see, think that's what we see in our text here this morning that we are to live for him, to suffer for him, and even if it means so, die for him. Last week, we closed out chapter 3 with verses 18 through 23 here in 1 Peter. So, uh, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, or chapter 4, excuse me, looking at verses 1 through 6. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And as we closed out chapter 3 last week, we saw how Peter was encouraging his readers in their suffering. And again, remember the, the passage before that that Nate went over in chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, where we see the believers respond, the, how the believer is to respond to suffering. Those believers who suffer for righteousness. And there, as Nate went over, we saw in verse 14 that Peter says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, of them who cause you to suffer. And Peter goes on to explain, instead of fear, that the, his readers were to respond by honoring Christ the Lord in their hearts as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And then he goes on and talks about uh, how that should be done. And so then last week we saw Peter give explanation to that response that he was calling for there in that passage. That instead of fearing, they should realize they are blessed. And he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And as Peter would go on there, 
Uh, not only talking about Christ's suffering and his death, but talking also, too, about Christ's victory. That Christ has risen and, as verse 22 says, has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Christ has indeed suffered. And Christ, after suffering, had won the victory. His suffering gave way to victory, and he brings that victory to all who believe upon him, all suffering for righteousness. We can know we are blessed when we suffer for righteousness. We can know because we have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what he said when he laid the foundation uh, for all things that he's talking about here back in chapter 1. Though we may suffer now, we have the hope of victory as Christ suffered and won the victory. And now as we we come then to chapter 4, we see that Peter draws a conclusion from everything that he said there in verses 18 to 22. That since Christ suffered and won the victory, believers who suffer for righteousness are blessed. That Christ has won for them the victory. And so Peter concludes then that believers should be willing to suffer. That believers should be willing even to die if that is God's will for them as they live for God's will. And so let's, let's read our passage here for this morning. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does." And so we see this passage starts off with the word therefore, which again points us back and shows that Peter is drawing a conclusion to what he had just said. And so there in verse 1 saying, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, uh, that specifically points back to chapter 3, verse 18, where he says, for Christ also suffered. And then at the end of that verse saying, being put to death in the flesh. And since Christ's suffering gave way to victory, Christ is the pattern for believers who suffer for righteousness. And therefore, knowing this, Christians then should be willing to suffer. So knowing that Christ suffered in the flesh, Peter says here, we should arm ourselves or ready ourselves for suffering. The word here for being armed is a military word for preparation. It was to be ready or equipped with weaponry or armory. Or armor. The Christian is to have such a readiness when it comes to suffering. Because the truth is, not only is suffering a reality for Christians, suffering is a reality for being a Christian, for being a follower of Jesus Christ. So you who really follow Christ, be prepared. As a soldier is prepared for war, be prepared for suffering. And he says that we're to be prepared with the same way of thinking. Uh, That is the same attitude or willingness as Christ when he suffered his substitutionary death. When he suffered Christ being the righteous for the unrighteous. Because that is what Christ came to do. Uh, That was the will of God. And he was faithful to do it. So, too, the believer must be prepared with the same attitude towards faithfulness to God, towards suffering. And Peter says then, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, what's he saying there? Clearly, this is not referred to a believer obtaining sinless perfection, because... That's not going to happen this side of eternity. 
But if a believer is so willing to suffer for being a Christian, it demonstrates their commitment to follow their Lord. If one is willing to suffer in order to follow Christ, then it would only be the logical conclusion to understand that they would be willing to give up their sin in order to follow Christ. Willing to do whatever it means to follow Christ. If they're willing to endure ridicule, mockery, beatings, imprisonment, and even death, then that would be the evidence that they are willing to endure the pains of buffeting their own bodies, of resisting temptation, of placing themselves under accountability and exposing their sin or whatever it takes, whatever they must do in order to see whatever sin still remains in them is put to death. Whatever it takes to have victory over their sin. Uh, Let me put it this way. Uh, Some in their thinking are certain about their commitment to the Lord. They are certain that if push came to shove, and it came down to either you deny Christ or you die, they're convinced that they would stand firm in their commitment to Christ. And of course, this is proven genuine as they repost those Facebook memes of pictures of Jesus that say, share if you're not ashamed of Jesus. Because that shows the level of commitment. I, I, don't, I don't know how that works, but... But they're certain that they would be willing to endure backlash, suffering, and even to die for following Christ. Yet at the same time, they are unwilling to do what they must to endure internal pressures of temptation. They're unwilling to do what they must to put away habitual sin. They're unwilling to suffer to do what they must in order to give up uh, their regular involvement in gossip. Uh, or their consistent practice of dishonesty, or or taking God's name in vain, or or, or bitterness, or looking at pornography, or or drinking to excess and getting drunk, or whatever is an individual sin that they love and hold on to. And so to give it up would really take commitment, and would really take suffering under temptation. And so if one is not so committed to doing God's will and follow Jesus when it comes to the areas in their life, when one is not willing to live for Jesus their Lord, why would we think they would suffer and die for Jesus their Lord? And so Peter says, whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. If they're willing to suffer and die for following Jesus Christ, if that's God's will— then that is evident that they are committed to God's will in every area of their life. Whatever God calls them to. And as we've already seen in 1 Peter, he certainly calls his people to holiness. And what he's saying here is made very clear as we come to verse 2. Because there we see the reason they are willing to give up their sin in following Christ which is so as to live the rest of their life on earth, whether before they die or before Christ appears for his church, in in any case, however long they have left in this life, believers are not to live this life for human passions, but for the will of God. And that's the very reason that Peter commands that the believers arm themselves with the same attitude that was in Christ when he suffered that they would no longer live the ways that they used to live, but to live lives in pursuit of holiness, doing away with sin in their lives. Look to Christ. Arm yourself with the attitude that was in Christ, being so determined to do God's will that even if it means suffering and death, you will suffer and die. That's how determined you are. And in doing so, you follow the example of Christ. You arm yourself with the same attitude that he had. And so, my friends, in the battle against sin, look to Christ. In your battle against sin, see how he suffered once for sin. See how he endured to fulfill the Father's will. See it in the gospel. Preach the gospel to yourself daily. And so arm yourself 
in the pursuit of Christ-likeness. Arm yourself having the same way of thinking, the same attitude as your Savior. So resolve to do what is God's will, even if it means suffering in order to kill your sin, even if it means suffering and dying for your commitment to Jesus Christ. If you are trusting in Christ alone for your salvation, trusting in him because he alone is God come in the flesh, trusting in him because he alone suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he died in the place of all who would trust in him, satisfying the justice and wrath of God for them who believe, and that having died in the place of sinners, he rose again as the risen Lord of all. And my friends, if you are trusting in him, then you have the living hope of eternity with Jesus. You have the living hope of such a great inheritance kept for you by God. And this living hope is what you were born again into through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And if you've been born again, how can you continue to live in the same pursuits and the same sinful lives that you always lived in your old self before you were born again? How can you continue in unrepentant sin, living as if, living how you always were? If the truth of the matter is, you have trusted in Christ and instead have been born again, that you are no longer who you used to be. You are not who you once were. So put away the old passions. Put away the old lifestyle and instead live for what is the will of God. Live for him in full commitment to him. And look at verse 3. Here we see the reason that Peter gives as to why believers are to live the remainder of their time on earth, living not for human passions, but living for the will of God. Verse 3 says, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Uh, saying doing what the Gentiles want to do could also be translated as doing the intentions of the Gentiles. And it refers to the, how those who do not believe in the Lord, it refers to how they live. But if you are trusting in Jesus, if you know the Lord, how can you live as one who doesn't know the Lord? How can you still pursue fulfilling the desires of your natural self, doing what unbelievers intend to do? What unbelievers intend to do are not the things that believers intend to do. Because as, first, as Peter says here, for the believer, the time has passed to do such things. That time, however long it was, and whatever you did in that time, it was enough. It sufficed. Because you no longer want to live that way. You don't want to keep doing those things as if you have not gotten your fill. Because you have gotten your fill. You are, you are done with that. You don't want it anymore. You don't love those things anymore. You actually you hate those things because coming to Christ, being born again, now you love what God loves and you hate what God hates. So you don't want to go back. That was enough. And this is true of the believer that has been saved out of a lifestyle full of all the depravities that man can think of. And it's true of the believer that God saved at such an age where he never had the opportunities uh, to dive into the depths of his depravity. I remember hearing one pastor uh, talk about their testimony, saying that God saved him from a lifestyle of, of sex, alcohol, and drugs at the age of six. Uh, that, and his point was that God's grace was such that God saved him before he ever had a chance to get into those things. And, and I think he's implying that he would have gotten into those things if not for God's grace. And yet, for that pastor, uh, who was, he was, at the time at least, he was an elder at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, for him, the time that has passed before the Lord saved him 
That was enough. He doesn't need any more living in sin. That was it. And for me, and for you who believe, no matter when you were saved, and no matter what your life was, and what you did or didn't do, it was enough, for now you have been born again. Now you pursue living the rest of your life, not for the passions of man, not for the desires of your flesh, but for the will of God. And we see here, Peter, he gives a list, and this list, I think, is, is just examples of, of the things that unbelievers intend to do. Uh, the things that we once intended to do in our lives. I think this is an example of such things. As he says, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Three of those terms are, are related to sexual immorality. Two of them are related to alcohol. Uh, actually, one of them, uh, I've counted it in the list of three dealing with sexual immorality, but I think, too, it can be counted towards uh, drunkenness, because I think those things go together. We're talking about orgies. And the last thing that we see there in that list is lawless idolatry, which can be translated as disgusting idolatry. It's actually one of the evidences that people point to to say that Peter's audience must have been mostly Gentile, uh, because such overt idolatry would not have been in the background of Jewish believers. But it refers to the pagan worship practices that involve such things as temple prostitution and, and rank immorality and, and revelry, all such things that was part of the believer's old life, all the things that they left behind forsaking for the pursuit of God's revealed will in their commitment to their risen Lord. And my friends, when it comes to such a change in our lives, that we are clearly no longer who we used to be because we no longer do the things we used to do, those whom we used to do those things with will take notice. When there's such a change in our lives, the world will notice. And in all honesty, I think this is still part of that section in 1 Peter that we started back in chapter 2 in verses 11 and 12. There in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Peter said, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And so as we live no longer for the things that unbelievers intend to do, we live then as aliens and strangers in this world. We keep our conduct before unbelievers as honorable in the hopes that God would save some, that they would then proclaim his glories on the day of visitation, on the day he appears, because he saved them. See how great he is. And so our hope in all of these things is that we would gain the opportunity in proclaiming the gospel and that we would there show them a life then that is transformed by the truth and the power of the gospel. And we pray that God would use us to that extent. That they would give our God the praise and glory for his great salvation. That he would even maybe save them. That's our hope, but that's not often the response we get, is it? Uh, when we live a life differently than the world around us, when we live in contrast to the world around us. God will, by his means, draw those whom he has chosen to himself. He will certainly do so. But as we live in contrast to the world, very often we will find ourselves in conflict with the world. And for Peter's readers, uh, we've already discussed uh, in ways that they felt this backlash from the world. Peter's readers, they, they had the lifestyle that when the change came in them from God, that those that, they, that knew them, they recognized the difference. And the unbelievers were surprised by this. as the unbelievers no longer or the believers no longer join the unbelievers in the same flood of debauchery 
As Peter says there in verse 4, it can also be translated as dissipation, and it refers to the, the wasteful or reckless living of the unbelievers engulfed with fulfilling their, their own pleasures. And the word flood there demonstrates the extent of their immoral living. And it could serve then, too, to highlight the change that is in the believers, that they no longer run with them into such a flood of debauchery. And so the response then from the unbeliever to the believer whose life has been changed very often is being maligned, being slandered. That's what Peter says there. And we've discussed already uh, in this series how Christians in Peter's day uh, were slandered by the world around them. Uh, They were accused of practicing incest uh, because they called each other brothers and sisters. And we even saw in this letter here how Peter called for a family or brotherly love amongst one another. They were accused of being cannibals because for the communion supper they ate the body and blood of Christ. Now, we know that the bread and the juice or wine was not actually the body and blood of Christ, but the elements that represent the body and blood but nonetheless, they were accused of such things uh, because they, they only served one God instead of the many gods of, of, of the Roman Empire. Uh, they were called atheists and were accused of being against the empire. So they were maligned in many ways. Peter's uh, readers would have known uh, such slander towards them. My friends, as we think of this, Maybe you yourself, in your own experiences, you have endeavored to proclaim Christ to your family and friends or coworkers, uh, and maybe too, as, as God has been doing a work in your life, and, and you have uh, turned away from sin and no longer doing the things you used to do with those you used to do it with. Maybe you have found some in your life have turned away from you. Maybe you have found that some in your life have maligned you, and maybe at times you feel as if you are all alone in this. Who is there to stand for you? Who is there to defend you when you are maligned? And the question really comes down, my friends, is it, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Do we count it a great privilege to suffer for him who suffered for us when he died on the cross for our salvation? Isn't it worth it to know God may use our lives to draw others to himself? And what more, is it not worth it when we know that after we have suffered in this life for a little while, we will at last know the victory that Christ has purchased for us in his death and resurrection? That we will enter into our inheritance that is kept for us by God, and we will be with our great God forever to share in his glory as we follow the pattern that Christ has set for us where suffering gives away to glory? Is it not worth it? Are we not willing to be maligned? Are we not willing to suffer for our great God? We are when we understand how worthy our God is and how worth it is to suffer for living to please our God and do his will. As we arm ourselves with the same attitude that was in Christ, Resolve to do God's will, even if it means we suffer, even if it means we die. And so arming ourselves with this attitude, again, we follow the example of Christ. And we've already seen Peter lay before his readers the example of Christ for them to follow. We saw that when he showed them how he responded to his suffering, back in chapter 2, verse 23. There we read, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And we see here as we come to verse 5 that we can do the same thing. We can trust ourselves to the great and righteous judge, knowing that he is the one who judges justly. We can entrust ourselves to him. This righteous judge will make every wrong right. Verse 5 says, But they, uh, referring to those who malign the believers, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. My friends, no injustice will go unpunished. 
And for the one who never repents of their sin, they will face this great God on judgment day. And every word, every thought, every deed will be brought into account before him. And so, my friends, if there are those who have turned on you, if you feel that there is no one standing for you, no one to defend you, know that the Lord is for you. You can trust him. Every lie will be exposed. Everything done in secret will be brought into the light on the day of judgment. And God, the one who is the just judge, will make every wrong right. And this is the very truth, that the unbeliever will stand before God who is ready to judge the living and the dead. All will stand before him. And in the understanding that all will stand before him, Peter goes on to say in verse 6, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. And when he says, this is why, I think that's actually pointing ahead to the next clause that explains what he says there. Now, there are some who argue about what, what exactly does he mean when he says that the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. But I think as we, we take those possible options and we examine them and, and see how they fit into the context, I think we can actually come to a conclusion of what Peter really is saying here. And I think once we do that, we see that the point is that the gospel is preached to those who are now currently dead that they were not dead when the gospel was preached to them, but by the time Peter is then writing his letter, those people have died. And it's probable that they died a martyr's death because of the persecution they faced. And the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, is so that though judged in the flesh the way people are, and really I think here the, the Christian Standard Bible is a little more helpful. It says, judged in the flesh according to human standards. And so referring to something like the, the common notion of that day, believing that Christians were fools, uh, because unbelievers saw no advantage in being a Christian. They, they looked at their lives and they just saw, well, you just suffer, and then after suffering, you die like the rest of us. So <laughs> what advantage is there to that? And so they're judged in the flesh according to human standards. And to be honest, we, we, we have to think about that ourselves. What is the advantage to being a Christian? Uh, it seems pretty hard in living this life here in this, this world. And again, I think we go back to the introduction. Who is the Jesus that you were introduced to? Is he the Jesus of life enhancement? The Jesus to make everything better? And yet as you go through your life, you find things maybe even got harder. So is that a Jesus worth living for? But my friends, this life getting better and being problem-free and not suffering really is not the promise of Christianity. It's not the promise of God's Word. I would argue the promise we're given is far greater. Certainly there is an advantage to being a Christian. Uh, looking for life enhancement in this life means we're looking for something that is short and temporary. But the hope that we are given in Jesus Christ is an eternal hope. We have far better than any prosperity preacher can offer. That, not, that we will suffer in this life. But after suffering, we will go on to eternity with our God. We will live according to God in the Spirit. We will be in His presence. That's what Peter's getting at here. And isn't that a great hope? That the gospel was preached to us that we have believed that even if we die, we have the great joy of knowing, as the Apostle Peter expressed in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Isn't that a great hope? And isn't the great hope of the church that Christ will come and appear for his church and those who died believing in Christ, they will rise first and then the rest of us who are still alive will be caught up with them in the air? And then what does Peter say, or Paul say there in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17? He says, and so we will always be with the Lord. Always be with the Lord. That's the great hope of that passage. 
You know, very often people have a, a lower, a lesser hope. You know, when they think about being dying in this body, they think about going to streets of gold, which, I mean, that's great. That's, that's, that's good. And they think about not having ailments anymore. And, and, and sure, that's true and, and a great thing. Or they think about the sweet reunion that there will be with loved ones who have gone on before. And when a loved one dies believing in the Lord, certainly there will be. I think even seen in that passage there in 1 Thessalonians 4, there will be a reunion. And I have no doubt it'll be a sweet reunion. But for however great that reunion will be, for however great the pavement in heaven will be, I assure you, being with Jesus Christ is far greater. That is the hope that we have. That is the hope that sustains us in this life, no matter what we face, no matter what we go through. That when all is said and done here, our suffering will give way to glory because we will go and be with him who is the king of glory. And we will share in that glory and be with him forever. That is far greater than any life enhancement we can experience in this short life. That we will be with our Lord forever. And when we have that hope, we can arm ourselves with the same attitude that was in Christ, determined to do the will of our God no matter what it costs, no matter what it means. That we can do his will and live for him even if it costs us our life because we know this life is temporary anyway. We have all are sinners and we've earned death and dying in the flesh is a consequence of sin, but we have been given life in Jesus Christ and we will rise again because Christ is risen and we can live this life now born again into this living hope through Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. That is what our hope is. That is how we arm ourselves with the attitude that was in Christ, willing to do the will of God, no matter what it costs. Willing to do the will of God, even if we suffer and die, knowing that he is worth it. And we have the eternal hope of being with him who is worth it. How great is our awesome God. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnvbc.com.